Strong hands, firm knees, and a trusting heart are yours from God your Father and his promises which are fulfilled in his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that we're going to study together this morning is Isaiah 35. And have you take out your worship folder and open up there. We're going to refer to all of the verses, but we're going to really focus on verses 3 and 4, and then on verse 8 and following. We'll also be referring to the gospel reading that's printed at the bottom of that page. So I asked the kids, but now I'll ask you, what do you fear? What are you afraid of? What, what keeps you up at night? What, what brings worry and stress and concern to your heart? In your life. The people of Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel, feared the Assyrians. When Isaiah began preaching to Judah, they and also the northern kingdom of Israel were experiencing good times. Their military was strong. In fact, they weren't just defending their country, they were expanding their lands and territories. Their economy was strong, everybody was living the good life, so to speak, and, and things were going so well that they actually began to trust more in their power and wealth than in God. Sound familiar? Well, at the same time, the Assyrians were growing in power. In fact, by the time Isaiah prophesied chapter 35, the Assyrians had attacked the northern kingdom of Israel and conquered them and carried most of the Jews to live in a faraway land. And now the Assyrians were knocking at the door of Judah and the people were afraid. And so God sent his prophet to say, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Today God sends his prophet Isaiah to speak those words to you. God says, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. And so I ask you again, what do you fear? Maybe like the people of Judah, you fear a foreign power overtaking our country someday. I mean, maybe you're afraid that Russia will overtake us or China, or maybe you're uh, afraid that that North Korean guy will send a nuclear bomb, or maybe you're afraid that president-elect will send a nuclear bomb. Maybe you're afraid of worldwide terrorism or even homeland security because there are bombs and people driving cars off the road just about anywhere. Maybe you're afraid of those things, but my guess is that your deepest fears are a little closer to your heart. Do you fear whether or not you'll fit in? Whether or not someone will love you and accept you just the way you are? Are you afraid that you won't make the grade or make the team or get the job? You ever afraid that you won't be able to make ends meet at the end of the month? Or, or if you're saving enough to last you through your golden years? Are you afraid that you might never find the special someone with whom you can spend the rest of your life? Or, or maybe you found someone, but they're gone now, and you're not sure if you will find anyone else. Are, are you afraid of loneliness? Are you afraid that you might never have the children or grandchildren you've always dreamed of? Or maybe you have them, but now you're afraid all your fears have been transferred to them. And, and you're afraid that they won't fit in, or they won't make the grade, or they won't make the team, or they won't get the job, or they won't get married, or they won't have enough money. It just goes on and on, doesn't it? I mean, are you afraid of not having a healthy body? <coughs> are you afraid of death? The future? Turn it? Why do you fear, O oh, you of little faith? Didn't you hear God say, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come? Well, you're in good company. In our gospel reading, we hear how even John the Baptist 
feared and doubted. John the Baptist, this is the one about whom Jesus would say that, that he is not just a prophet, but that he is great in the kingdom of God. This is the one about whom Isaiah prophesied, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. This is the guy who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, heard the Father's voice from heaven, saw the dove come down. This is the guy who pointed right at Jesus and said, that one, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But now John's in prison and he's doubting and he's afraid. So he sends some disciples to ask Jesus, are you... The one? Uh, are you the Messiah, the Christ? Are, are you God with us? Or should we expect someone else? Why would John have such doubts and fears? Well, because he was in prison. Because Jesus wasn't coming to break him free. Because whether he knew it or not, John was about to literally lose his head. Because probably... John grew up, like most of the Jews, expecting that the Messiah would overthrow the evil government and establish a, a, a the history of old Israel of old with strong, strong military and strong economy. And that wasn't happening. So while John's sitting in prison, he's wondering, maybe I got it wrong. Why do you fear? Isn't it because you live in a sinful world? Earlier, Isaiah described this world in our lives as a dry, parched, desert wasteland. I mean, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, this world has been cursed. And so were you, and so was your life, because we were all born with this sin that we inherited from our sinful parents. And sin ruins life, and it causes fear and stress and anxiety and worry and all of the problems that we have. The reason you don't fit in is because of sin. The reason that we don't always have everything that we need is because of sin. It's all connected to sin. And we know, because we've tried, that we can't do anything about it. Right? Have you ever, have you ever told yourself, just, just be strong, just dig down deep, and, and you can make it through this? And for a little while, that works. But eventually, the problems are too many and they're too big. And you cannot make them all go away. And no, it's not going to just be okay. It's not true. Not until God steps in. So John, or Jesus tells John's disciples, quit looking at yourself. And don't look at all of the problems that are causing your fears and doubts. Instead, Jesus says, look at me. John, Jesus tells John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard, which was the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 35. Jesus said, look around, the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak, the lame walk, the, the, those who had diseases are cleansed, even the dead are raised, and the good news of the gospel is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus said, if you aren't sure, look at the evidence of the miracles, and they prove your God has come. Be strong. Do not fear. Isaiah said, your God will come. Jesus said, I have come. And doesn't he say the same thing to you? Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. God kept his promise to come down to this earth himself and to save us. But here's where we have to be clear. Jesus did not come to release John from prison. Jesus did not come so that he could rescue John from losing his head, and Jesus didn't come to overthrow the evil government. Nor did Jesus come so that you could fit in. Jesus did not come so that you could get a college degree, find a good job, make a lot of money. Jesus didn't even come so that you could get married and have kids and live this glorious life on earth. Jesus didn't come to solve all of your problems. He did come to solve the problem that causes all of the other problems, and that's sin. In fact, Isaiah talked about that too. Look at verse 8. He, he just got done describing the, this land that when God would come, the dry desert wasteland would turn into this lush, 
um, garden and forest. We'll talk about that in a second. But then he said in verse 8, a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. <laughs> Jesus came to pave the way of holiness. It's a way that leads us through the dry, desert, parched wilderness of the sin-cursed life of this world out of this world into heaven. Jesus paved the way of holiness by becoming God with us. He was born and wrapped in human flesh, and he lived in this sin-cursed world. And that means that Jesus knows all of the things that cause you worry and fear. Jesus knows what it's like to not fit in. Can you imagine his brothers and sisters? What do you think, you are the perfect child or something? Well, actually. Jesus knows what it's like to be lonely. You hear it often, Jesus withdrew to places by himself. Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry, and to not have a lot. Jesus knows what it's like to be thirsty when he was parched on the cross. Jesus knows what it's like to lose a loved one, whether it was probably his stepfather Joseph or his best friend Lazarus. Jesus knows what it's like to face death. But more important than the fact that Jesus can sympathize with us because he's been there and done that is the fact that he did it perfectly. All throughout his life, even as he experienced tragedy and difficulty and the troubles of this life, but more importantly, as he was tempted by the devil, Jesus stood with strong hands and firm knees and an always trusting heart. I just read this in Matthew 4 the other day, and Jesus is led into the wilderness, and he goes 40 days without eating and drinking, and talk about being hungry. And so the devil comes and says, Jesus, if you're the son of God, and, and because you're hungry, why don't you just turn the stones into bread? If God's not going to take care of you, maybe you have to do it yourself. And what does Jesus say? Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus always and perfectly trusted in his Father, even in the worst of times. And God did not deliver Jesus. He, he didn't give him bread that day. But he gave him strength. And because of Jesus' perfect trust in God, he paved the way of holiness. There is now a path that leads out of this world full of troubles into a world where there is no longer any sin or any of the problems that it causes. The path exists, but now you need to get on the path. Jesus did that too. A highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. But the unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. Skip to the middle of verse 9. Only the redeemed will walk there. Unfortunately, most people in our world today are not walking on the way of holiness. And as long as their sin clings to them, they aren't allowed. Only the redeemed. But that's what Jesus' death is all about. After Jesus lived a perfect life and paved the way of holiness, he died to buy us back from the curse that owns us, from sin and death and all of the problems in between, and through not through gold or silver, but through his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death, Jesus takes away our sin, he claims us as his own, he covers us with his holiness, and he puts us on the path that leads to heaven. This is the greatest thing that could ever be. There's not only a way out, but Jesus puts you on it. He calls you his own. Now there's still danger. Because as soon as you are on the path to heaven, the devil wants to get you off. In fact, you shouldn't be surprised that your life as a Christian is more difficult than that of the unbeliever. Satan does not have to work hard to get the unbelievers on the path to hell. They're already there. But he has to work really hard to get you off the path to heaven and back onto the path to hell. And you know how he does it. He tries to fill your heart with fear. He tries to distract you with all kinds of things that you can't do anything about. You can't work hard enough to make sure you have enough money to last to the end of life. 
You can't eat well enough to assure that you will always be healthy. You can do your best to drive safely, but you can't stop someone else from ramming into your car and stealing someone that you love. You can't do anything about it, but God can. And he promises he does. He says, no lion will be on that path, that highway to heaven, nor any ravenous beast. As long as you're on the path to heaven, not even the devil himself can harm you. Does that mean that nothing bad will ever happen to you? Absolutely not. It just means that when all those things that are out of your control come, God will give you strong hands and firm knees and a trusting heart. Because you know that even if you don't have food on earth, even if you never make the team, even if you never get married or have the children or the grandchildren that you want, even if you lose all of the things that you already have, as long as you have God, you have hope. Because this path leads out of this sin-cursed world into a brand new land. Isaiah describes it at the beginning. The desert and parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice and greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of God, the, the glory of the Lord, and the splendor of our God. Isaiah describes that this, this wilderness, this desert parched land, this sin-cursed world that we live in, it will change. And it will become this beautiful, lush garden and forest with life and water all along. But here's the best part. Go to the very end of verse 10. And you will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown your heads. Gladness and joy will overtake you. Sorrow and sighing will flee. This is what awaits you at the end of the way of holiness. Along the way, there's trouble. But God promises to protect you and to give you strength until that day when he takes you out of this world and you enter Zion with singing. There's no more sin. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sigh. Can you imagine? Can you imagine waking up and having nothing to worry about? But pure joy, the pure gladness that crowns your head, it overwhelms you. So why do you fear? Be strong. Do not fear because your God will come. In fact, he has already come. Jesus came and wrapped himself in flesh. He faced all of the struggles and all of the temptations that we do, but he did it perfectly. He paved the way to holiness. By his innocent death and his holy precious blood, he has redeemed you and put you on the path to heaven. And by the power of his word, he promises to keep you on the path and to send away the lion and all of the other things that threaten you until that day when you will enter Zion with singing and everlasting joy will crown your heads. Be strong. Do not fear. Not only has your God come, he will come again. As you prepare your hearts for Christmas, Spend time in the way of holiness, which is nothing more than to continue hearing and remembering and singing and praying the promises your God has made you. None greater than this. Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which goes beyond our human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting.